coach. I'm your relationship coach. I'm Laura Wing. And today I am joined by Mr. Mark Huber. Mark, welcome to this webinar. Well, thank you for having me, Laura. I'm delighted to be here and I'm very excited and looking forward to uh, hearing what you have to say. Well, thank you for joining me. Today, Mark, we're going to be talking to folks about how to have a God-solid marriage. And so, you know, there are a lot of people out there who have questions about marriage. I don't think anybody gets marriage with, married with a manual. So we're going to answer some of those questions today. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank everyone for joining us on this call today. And um, just want to let you know that you are in the right place. So listen, if you are happy with your marriage, if you're not happy with your marriage, if you've been married for a long time, you're newly married, you're thinking of getting married, you're afraid you might get a divorce, or you just want your marriage to be better than ever, then you are absolutely in the right place. Anyone's gonna be able to benefit from this important webinar today. <clears throat> excuse me, because there are techniques that are going to apply to married couples at any stage of marriage, even if they are contemplating divorce. So Mark, are you ready for all of this great information? I'm on board, looking forward to it, strapped in, ready to go, rock and roll. We are going to have so much fun learning some pretty basic stuff here today. Did you know the biggest problem in marriage today is the lack of well, I'm not going to share that right now, but if you'll hang on to the end, you'll be able to find out what the biggest problem in marriage today is. It's a lack of one thing. It's one key ingredient that will change and revolutionize every marriage. And during this webinar, you're going to find out all of the answers you need with tangible ways to start having the marriage of your dreams. You know, people are budgeting for their weddings, they're saving for weddings, they're planning for these nice, wonderful, beautiful weddings, while the divorce industry, however, remains a multi-billion dollar industry. Is that not staggering? No, it's shocking. It's terrible. The only people who get rich in a divorce, believe me, are the attorneys. So here's what's going on. Divorce rates are climbing more people are giving up on marriage. Less people are getting married. And I venture to say the reason less people are getting married is because they're looking around and they're seeing so many of their friends and relatives getting divorced that they're saying, you know what, I don't want that to happen to me, so I'm just not going to get married. Because marriage in our society is portrayed as difficult. The institution of marriage is absolutely falling apart. But stick around because we're going to reveal the number one way to have a God-solid marriage. And trust me, you need this. There's also some bonus information available to those of you who stay for the entire webinar. So stay tuned, fasten your seatbelts, get ready. We're getting on this. So I want to share with you what made me decide to start fighting against the billion-dollar divorce industry. On July 19th, 1984, I was 18 years old, and I married the love of my life. I was 18, he was 19, and we thought, like most teenage kids, that we knew everything there was to know about life. And I went into this marriage wide-eyed and bushy-tailed and excited, and three kids later, life got real. I thought marriage was going to be this one big ball of romance all the time. And, and who knew that there were going to be things like mortgage payments and car payments. And then the children came along and, and that added some stress to the marriage. And so very quickly, I became disillusioned. Not that my marriage was in great trouble or, you know, on the brink of falling apart or anything like that, but I had looked around and seen so many people in my life getting divorced. My parents had been married for 28 years and then got divorced. My grandparents, all of my grandparents had been divorced. My siblings had all been divorced. My cousins had been divorced. And I said, I don't want that to happen to me. And so I was on a personal mission to find the keys to a successful and happy marriage. 
When I found those keys to that happy marriage, I started using some of the techniques that I had discovered and I started using them with my clients. And my clients, some of them found great success and happiness when they too started to apply the techniques to their own marriages. Well, I'm happy to tell you that as I started using this, these techniques in my marriage, our marriage just, like I said, it wasn't falling apart, but it just got stronger and happier and our, our children grew. And here we are, eight grandchildren later. One of them's not, not um, featured in this picture here because she's a newbie. But eight grandchildren later, our marriage is stronger than ever. And I have the opportunity to get to share the secrets to a happy marriage with so many other couples out there. So there's good news. What we know is that by learning how to fix the problems people experience in their marriages, there will be less divorce and the institution of marriage can be salvaged for all generations to come. So Mark, we're gonna talk about the seven biggest factors that can put a strain on marriage. We're gonna talk about number one, not understanding how to effectively communicate in someone else's communication field. Two, Bringing old baggage into a relationship can put a strain on a marriage. Three, unexpressed or unidentified expectations can put a strain on a marriage. Money fears and outside stressors can put a strain on a marriage. Not having a shared foundation of existence. We're going to talk about that later. Misunderstandings about healthy sex and marriage. And last, fear of forgiveness. So these are the things that we'll be discussing today, and we're going to tackle some of these pretty, pretty deep issues here, Mark. You know, I know that um, as we go along this webinar today, I think that you're, you're even going to be amazed by some of these things. I know as a financial expert, you do marketing and you help people with finances. You've, you've seen couples that have had some of these strains on their marriage as they've come into your office to seek financial help from you. Am I right about that? You're absolutely right. And uh, I see this on a very regular basis and uh, it's, it's sad. And uh, I often have to put a hat on that I don't uh, feel comfortable wearing, which is, you know, a bit of a marriage counselor because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it does come down to money and how we work with it and deal with it. And uh, that's one of the biggest stressors that, uh, that I see and have to deal with um, besides, you know, the, the money in the portfolio bit. So I wear a couple of hats. So I'm looking forward to gaining some insights from you, uh, from your years of, uh, of counseling. And uh, perhaps it'll uh, give me some, uh, some insights so I can be better at what I do and be, be more helpful to those I serve. Well, that's great. And we are, we're going to go ahead and we're going to move on. And right away, I want to let everybody know that this is what I call VIP information, very important information. In fact, if you don't learn this here, make sure you learn this somewhere. This, what I'm about to share with you is key to everything. It's going to help you understand everything about your spouse. This is very important information, so make sure that you get a good grasp on this. Are you ready? Men and women think and communicate differently. Let's say that again. Men and women think and communicate differently. Now, I know that's not surprising information to anyone. We know that men and women think and communicate differently. But here's, here's the thing. We don't really understand how our spouse is thinking. We just know that they do think differently. And so we're going to dive right in and talk about that. So what we know is that men tend to be a little more single task minded, where women, on the other hand, are multitask minded. So what does that mean? It means that men have a tendency to focus on one thing at a time, while women can focus on many different things all at once. And it goes back to we're going to just go way back to caveman days and we're going to talk about this just being natural instinct. You see, men were the hunters and the gatherers and it was their job to go out and to kill the wild beast, bring it back to the cave and the women would 
cook the meals and, and clean the cave and take care of the children. Well, it was important that men stayed focused on one thing at a time. They needed to keep their head in the game, so to speak. And so they were wired from the dawn of time to be single task minded as a matter of survival. So they're out there and they're focusing on their hunting of the game so that they don't get killed. Meantime, women back at the cave were busy focusing on many things all at once. The food that was cooking, the children that were in the background playing or crying. She had to be able to be on high alert at all times and aware of several different things going on and that also meant survival. So we were wired differently from the very beginning. Men have a tendency to separate the items that they are thinking about. I love a really um, popular marriage coach by the name of Mark Gungor. He has a wonderful program called Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage. And in there, he talks about how men have a tendency to, they have little, little boxes or little rooms for each different subject. So they might have a, a box for the car, a box for their job, a box for you know their hobbies and and they have a box for you and then he talks about this box called a an empty box it's a nothing box and they're in this box and they're thinking about nothing well women on the other hand aren't like that when they're thinking about something everything is connected to everything so they may be thinking about the children, which is also causing them to wonder about their money situation, and they're thinking about a hundred things all at the same time. It's very normal for women to think of many things all at once. When men are trying to figure something out, they will think to figure it out. So they usually want to go into their empty box and think about something. Then when they have the answer, they'll speak about it. Women, however, need to talk to figure things out. Now, Mark, I think it's really important that we pause here for just a moment. And I wanna say that I'm painting with a big brush, a very broad brush. I understand that not all men are single task minded and not all women are multitask minded, but for generality's sake, we're just going to paint all men in one corner and all women in the other. Does that sound fair? Oh, I can certainly live with that, and I think uh, all our listeners would agree with that. Even though it's a generalization, uh, you pretty much hit the nail on the head here. Yeah, so we're just going, and you know, you can figure out for yourself whether or not you're completely single task minded or completely multitask minded, but generally speaking, this is how men are wired, and this is how women are wired. So, you know, we're dealing with someone else's communication field. Because men and women think and communicate differently, there are some things that, that happen. Women communicate with men their way. Men communicate with women their way. And sometimes those two things clash because we just don't understand something so simple as men are single task minded and women are multitask minded. So what can we do to communicate more effectively in someone else's communication field? Well, I'm gonna pick on women for just a moment. Women, this is how you can better communicate with your husband. First, be mindful of where his thoughts are. Remember, he's probably thinking about one particular item and all of a sudden you burst into his thoughts with, hey, would you, would you take out the trash? Would you mind running to the store and get a loaf of bread for me? Can you pick Johnny up from school? You know, whatever it is that you want to talk to him about, his thought may be on something completely different. You need to be mindful of where his thoughts are before you begin a conversation with him. And this will help to create a shift environment instead of a nag environment. I can't tell you how many times couples have been in my office, they sit in front of me, and what I hear is this. She's always telling me what to do. Nag, 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 nag. And I hear from, from women, he never listens to me. Well, women, you can change that by creating what is called a shift environment. And here's how that works. If your husband is, for example, sitting at the computer or watching a television program or playing with the dog, um, 
engaged in one of his hobbies and you walk up to him and say, hey, I need you to go do X, Y, Z. Well, his mind is not on X, Y, Z. His mind is on whatever task he's performing in that moment. So once you become mindful of that, now what you do is say, hey, would you, can I talk to you for just a moment? You've now gotten his attention. He shifted his attention to you and off of the thing that he's doing. Now you need to make sure that he's making eye contact with you and paying attention to you. And then you can begin giving your list of instructions. Women, men really only want one instruction at a time or a comprehensive list. We joke in our society about the honeydew list, but let me tell you women, men really do appreciate that. And here's why, because they are single task minded. If you say to them, I need you to take out the trash, run the dog to the vet, pick up a loaf of bread. You know, if you're spilling out all of these different instructions for him, his mind is probably only on the first instruction that you gave him, which was take out the trash. So he may take out the trash and then not do any of the other things. And you're saying to him, you never listen to me. Well, present him with one instruction at a time or a comprehensive list. Now that list doesn't have to be written. You can give it to him verbally, but you need to make sure that he's actually heard you. And you do that once you've created that shift environment. Another thing is to make sure that you give acknowledgement. In other words, compliment your spouse. Say to them, hey, you know, you always do such a great job of helping me when I need you to take out the trash, or you do a great job of taking the dog to the vet. Thank you so much for all of your help. You know, both men and women appreciate compliments. After you have given these instructions, you want to restate for confirmation. And what, I'm, what I don't mean by that is say it all over again and nag. You're simply saying, so... Um, just want to make sure here, after you've taken out the trash, you will go get the bread from the store. Am I right about that? And get that confirmation back from your spouse so that you know that they have actually heard you. Well, what do you think about that so far, Mark? Uh, it, it makes perfect sense. And I, I just have to quickly say uh, regarding the, the lists uh, and the one task, uh, I will be given a list to go to the store and uh, get a bunch of things. Uh, which I dutifully do and come back and then the question are oh did you see if such and such was on sale or did you happen to notice about this or about that and uh, what about this and and um, you know I'm looking and going uh, no I just had a list I had a task to do I went and did it and, and now I'm home because and, you're single task minded well yeah and I'm not interested in checking this out or that out because I've got other things to do so I'm happy to help did what I was supposed to do and I'm here and I, you know, I mean, and women, you know, they enjoy browsing and shopping and sharing and whatever. And it's a social event. And, you know, I get that, but it, it goes back to your point. We do think and act differently. Absolutely. So then what do you think men can do to communicate more effectively in a woman's communication field? Well, remember she needs to verbalize everything Men, we said, have a tendency to think and then speak. That's how, they, that's how they make decisions. That's how they work out issues in their, you know, in their brain. Women, however, they have to verbalize everything to make things make sense for them. So men, here's what you can do. You can listen and remember that she needs to verbalize everything. And there, we, there's passive listening. There's all different types of listening. But here's what I'm talking about. I know that you can hear. Your ears work. That's not the type of listening we're talking about. Listen with engagement. In other words, not a few times if you need to. Pay attention to what she's saying. Listen empathetically to her. Uh, just a simple, uh-huh, uh-huh, every now and then goes a long way. Now, you need to be making eye contact with her and genuinely engage in the process. I know that that can be a little tough for men because women, some women, not all women, have a tendency to go on and on and on about a subject, but remember, that's how she's, that is how she is putting the pieces together of the things that she's thinking, because she has to verbalize them. Acknowledge her feelings or instructions. So if you're 
wife is saying to you, oh my goodness, I had such a difficult day at work today and you know, my feelings got hurt over blah, blah, blah. Acknowledge those things. Say, oh, I understand you had a really hard day at work today and I'm sorry to hear that. Whatever, whatever it might be, acknowledge her feelings. Don't try to fix her feelings. Don't try to change anything. Don't jump in there and try to rescue her from what happened during the day because she's liable to want to murder you if you do that. Just acknowledge the feelings or the instructions. If she says, honey, I've had a really long day. Would you mind going and picking up some pizza to bring home to eat? Just acknowledge that. I'm sorry you had a hard day. Yes, I will pick up some pizza. If you're really going to pick it up, don't lie to her. Again, men, women love compliments just as much as men appreciate being complimented. Compliment her. You always do such a great job at fill in the blank. And you need to give her reassurance. Give her a time frame for the task that you're going to complete. If you tell her, yes, I will take out the trash, and you're in the middle of something, it's okay to say, okay, as soon as I am done watching this television program or putting this piece back on the car, I'll be more than happy to take the trash out for you. You've done two things by saying that. First off, you've acknowledged that you heard what she asked you. And secondly, you've given her some reassurance that you're actually going to accomplish the task that she's asking you to accomplish. Just repeat back some of the things that she's asked you to do or some of the things that she said and make sure that you actually follow through. Man, if you tell your, your wives that you're going to do something and really, Mark, this is kind of a two-way deal. Women, it's the same thing. If you tell your spouse that you're going to do something, follow through. The more times that you follow through on a task, the less likely she's going to be nagging. She won't nag you as much because she'll know, well, when I ask him to do something, he says he's going to do it. He usually does. I have no reason to nag him. That was a lot to take in, don't you think? Uh, it, it is, but I think that's a great starting point because uh, it all comes back to understanding the uniqueness and differences that uh, each uh, of us possess. And then uh, looking forward to uh, how you're going to put this all together on a go forward to uh, help us all out in our marriages. So I'm, I'm, I'm here. Well, like I said, very important information. Men and women think and communicate differently. And so if you can just just learn that, that little tip right there, and learn how to communicate in your spouse's communication field. It's going to revolutionize your marriage. So one of the other problems that happens in a marriage is that people come into a marriage sometimes with heavy baggage. So we're, there are all types of baggages that people bring into a marriage. There's even good baggage, things like traditions and values that people bring into a marriage. We're not talking about that. Today, unfortunately, we're going to talk about the heavy baggage. Sometimes messages we get growing up or from past relationships, they can interfere with having a happy marriage today. So the, here are some examples of baggage from the past that people unfortunately have a tendency to drag into their marriage. Maybe they came from an abusive or neglectful childhood. Maybe they have health issues, physical or mental issues. Maybe they bring financial issues into the marriage. Maybe they come into this marriage with a lot of debt. And, and Mark, you've probably seen that throughout your lifelong career. I certainly have. I certainly have, Laura. Some people bring spiritual issues into a relationship. Maybe they came from a past relationship that was not good. Maybe they had trouble in that relationship. And they, they tend to assume that this spouse is just like the person that they came from a relationship with. Or maybe they have fears, fears of abandonment, fears of intimacy. There are all types of fears that people can bring into a marriage. I'm gonna give you an example of one. When I was coaching a couple several years ago, it, I, they, they were really having some pretty serious problems because of some baggage that was brought into their marriage from the past. The wife, was not only abandoned as a child emotionally, but she was abandoned physically, literally left, you know, out on a street. And um, she came into this 
marriage with a lot of abandonment fears and was very convinced that her husband was going to leave her, that he was going to cheat on her and constantly saying things to him like, you know, well, you're going to leave me anyway. And so no matter how many times he reassured her, look, I'm, I'm not going to leave you. It didn't help. And here they were sitting in my office. And what we found out was she was projecting those fears that she, that, you know, she had as a young child onto him. And it wasn't fair because what she was doing was really pushing him away and pushing him out of the marriage. So we worked through that and, you know, I'm, I'm happy to report that once she was able to tackle some of that, those issues and get rid of that baggage, they went on to have a very successful, very happy marriage. So those are just some examples of baggage from the past. So Mark, I, I kind of threw a little, um, a little thing in here. I know that I'm kind of surprising you with this, but I don't have time in this webinar to help people unpackage all of the baggage that they may have. There's no way possibly to do that. So instead, here's what I'm doing. If you will just mention this webinar code, the code is Laura, that's my name, you'll receive a discount on your first personal relationship coaching session. And that's an opportunity for you to start unpacking some of your own personal baggage. There are just too many people will be joining this webinar for me to do that in the webinar. Does that sound like a good deal to you, Mark? That sounds like a fabulous offering, and I would certainly encourage uh, everybody to uh, to pick up on that. And uh, I think that'll be more evident as uh, as the webinar unfolds and as we all uh, listen to your uh, to your wisdom here, Laura. So thanks for uh, for offering that up. All right. So yes, it is important, people, that you get rid of some of that past baggage that you may have brought into your marriage. I want to talk to you for just a second. I have a little plaque in my office. It says expectations are premeditated resentments. Let's say that again. Expectations are premeditated resentments. So what do we mean by that? I'm going to tell you this little story about expectations and how it led to a resentment in a friend of mine. Well, I was busy working a lot, putting in some long hours and, um, called my friend up, said, hey, you want to go get some lunch? And we went to lunch. Well, it was her birthday. <laughs> and Mark, I'm embarrassed to say this, but the fact that it was her birthday was not on my radar. I had completely forgotten her birthday. And we made it through the whole lunch. And, um, you know, I went home. And, and this was a really good friend of mine, somebody that I, I spent a lot of time with. And gosh, a week went by and I didn't hear from her. And I tried calling. I didn't get an answer back. And couple weeks went by and finally it was about a month and I finally nailed her down. I said, Hey, what's going on? I haven't heard from you, you know, since we went to lunch. And she said, well, you know, you kind of hurt my feelings. It was my birthday. You didn't even tell me happy birthday. Ah, <laughs> that was a big friendship fail on my part. Let me tell you. But what happened on her end is that she obviously had this expectation and probably rightfully so. But she had this expectation that as her best friend, I was going to take her to lunch for her birthday, tell her happy birthday, maybe give her a present, something. And I didn't do that. And when I didn't live up to her expectations, she suddenly developed a resentment. And I see that happening in so many marriages. Because people come into a marriage and they have an expectation of what marriage is supposed to be like. I grew up with the old black and white television shows that talked about, you know, I, I don't know if they talked about, but, you know, mom and dad were always happy and whatever problems they may have had were solved in 30 minutes or less. And life was just roses. Dad would come home through the door, kiss mom on the cheek. And, you know, they, they were just good times. And so I thought when I got married, it was going to be like that. And Although it wasn't horrible, it certainly wasn't what I had expected. Sometimes people have unrealistic expectations of sex and marriage. And we're going to go through a little bit more on that later in, in this, um, you know, in, the, in this webinar. But they have these unrealistic expectations. They think now that we're married, we're going to have hot sex all the time. And, you know, things happen to people as they get older. Their bodies change. 
their um, the people, jobs get in the way, schedules, things like that. And so all of a sudden, life isn't measuring up to those expectations that they had. They have expectations about money. Um, Mark, we have a seminar course. There's an actual course that's going to be available for people to take at the end of this webinar program. And if they sign up for that course, one of the things that they will get in that course is a simple budget form. And I'm not going to get into all of that right now. But sometimes people come into a marriage with expectations about money. You see that happen? Oh, totally. Yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> and uh, as you said, everybody has these rosy expectations of, uh, of life and marriage and uh, speci specifically about money. So if you can get people to focus on a, on a, on a single page uh, to, uh, to get their uh, ideas, uh, uh, it'll be amazing the, um, the information that flows out of that. And uh, yes, you'll have to put your counseling hat on, but uh, it's well worth it for, for them and ultimately you uh, for, for building you know, good, strong relationships and uh, helping people move forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. So people have communication expectations. They think that once they get married, their spouse is going to speak to them the same way that they did prior to being married. But here's the thing. Once we get comfortable with people, all of a sudden our communication with that person changes. And so, you know, I always, I, I call this the romance dis disillusion. People think, they're going to say all of these poetic and flowery words that they did when they were dating, and then here they are married, and oops, it, that's not reality for them anymore. Sometimes people have religious or spiritual expectations. They, they want people to live up to a certain, um, a certain expectation that they have regarding, maybe they, they were very staunch in a religion that they grew up with, and they expect their spouse to adhere to those same practices. Unexpressed expectations about personal goals, desires, hobbies. Oh my goodness, I see this happen just, I, just almost every single time that I have couples in my office. And especially people like myself who got married very, very young. You know, I don't think at 18 years old I knew what my personal goals or hobbies were. But as time went on and I just said, hey, I kind of want to take up this hobby or I'm really interested in this thing or I want to go back to school when when these things started to present themselves you know and, and my husband as well we we were a little annoyed <laughs> I see other couples being a little annoyed well gosh you're going to start taking time away from me we're not going to get to spend as much time together or how dare you want to spend money which I think goes back to that money expectation as well how dare you want to spend money on that hobby and so people have these unexpressed expectations that they come into a marriage about. Sometimes they, they have these expectations that have built up over time in the marriage. And so it's not even stuff that they've come into the marriage with, but they just build up over time. And so understanding what those expectations are and expressing them to one another is extremely important because when you don't express them to each other, you end up with resentments towards one another. Parenting expectations, another big one. I know a lot of people think, well, I want my, my wife to always be there when the kids get home from school and to have cookies and, and milk ready for them or I, I expect my husband to tuck the children in at night and read them bedtime stories every night. And then a funny thing happens called life. Mom isn't able to be home from school every day for the kids, or dad isn't able to tuck the kids in at night, or quite frankly, doesn't like to read stories to them, whatever the case may be. And people become very bitter about that. And a lot of those expectations are born out of fear, especially the parenting expectations that I see in people. It's, they're born out of fear. Well, I don't want my kids to grow up and resent us because we didn't do the things that I thought we should do for them. So there are just all types of expectations that can lead to resentments in marriage. Mark, we're going to move on and talk about money fears and outside stressors. And remember, this is so important, VIP information. Men and women think and communicate differently. 
So that probably means that they think and communicate differently when it comes to finances, when it comes to stress, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah, you got that one right, Laura, for sure. So let's start with money. There are various factors that give us messages about money. Some people are spenders and some are savers. Understanding your spouse's fears, desires, needs, goals, expectations, and values about money is extremely important. So we're going to talk about the different types of money personalities. I want to share with you, before we get into all that, I want to share with you a little story. I was coaching a couple many years ago, this, one, of my, one of the first couples that I coached, and <laughs> pardon me, so I also do business coaching and, and things of that nature, but primarily the marriage coaching, relationship coaching. And so this couple had come to me and they were having huge fights over money, a big, big fights over money. And the wife had grown up in an extremely impoverished situation. So, so much so that sometimes she would come home from school and there, there was no food in the house or you know, they didn't always have utilities turned on and she didn't have the, the right school clothes when school started. Sometimes they couldn't always afford school supplies for her. And so here they are, fast forward. She's, they're married now. And she thought, great, when I get married and have children, and they had, they had four children actually, when I get married and have children, my kids are not going to ever have to go through what I went through. And they had two very good incomes. And so she felt very um, much like she needed to provide things for the children that she didn't have. Her husband, on the other hand, also came from an extremely impoverished situation. Not quite as bad as hers, but it was, it was pretty lean when he was growing up. And he had watched his father lose all of his retirement and, and wasn't able to retire. And so he had his own fears about money and raising the children and he was constantly wanting to put money into a savings account and save for their future and invest their money. He wanted to secure a good um, retirement future for the two of them. So it's interesting to me that two people can come from nearly the same background but walk away from that background with a completely different feeling. And I'm sure you've seen that also, Mark. I think all of us have seen that where two people can come, it, they, two people can watch a, a car accident happen, for example, and give two different accounts of that accident. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> it gives lawyers grief all the time, I'm sure. That's, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So neither one of them were right or wrong, but here's what was going on. One of them was what we call the open wallet. And the other one was the closed account. So the open wallet person, and in your marriage, you'll have to determine which one of you is the open wallet and which one is the closed account, but the open wallet person has a tendency to spend more freely. And I'm not talking about just spending willy-nilly, but they, there's a reason they, they spend more freely. And the closed account person has a tendency to save for a rainy day. The open wallet person feels restricted by a budget, a budget can actually cause a little bit of anxiety for them where the closed account person feels secure in the budget. They prefer to have a budget. They want to watch where all the pennies and, and dollars are going. And Mark, I will tell you this, whenever, whenever I'm talking with people about budgeting, I prefer to call it a spending plan. And the reason that I like to call it a spending plan has a lot to do with the fact that the open wallet people feel so restricted just by that word budget. But let's mm -hmm. face it, whatever money comes into your household is going to get spent, whether it's being spent on, you know, the mortgage or utilities or on investments or being spent on a savings account. The money's going somewhere. You're going to allocate it to some place. And so I prefer to call it a spending plan than a budget simply because something about the, that wording really helps the open wallet person. It can scare the closed account person a little bit, but it does help the open wallet person. Yeah, I agree, Laura. I think uh, putting a little marketing spin on something like that uh, takes the, um, you know, tr the traditional um, concern about, uh, you know, um, 
scarcity and a, a budget and I can't, I can't do anything more than, you know, what's down here. And I like how you put it together because it really is just an, a cash flow analysis. Just, you know, let's see where the money goes and people Absolutely. are relieved and they can relax and then they, they, they open up because you're not trying to force something on them. We're, we're just wanting to take a peek under the hood here and then uh, go from there. Right, right. Absolutely. It just sort of, it takes the restriction away. And don't we all just love to spend rather than, you know, well, some people like to save, but you too, but really spending just, it just has a different connotation to it. The open wallet person is more now focused. That means that they are more concerned with what's happening in their, the present situation of their life. So going back to this couple that I was coaching, she was very concerned with now. Right now, the children need clothes. Right now, we need to get them school supplies. Right now, uh, we need a different car. It, very more now focused. The closed account person, however, is more future focused. Boy, if we spend all the money on clothes right now, what's going to happen four years from now when we're ready to retire? Or we want to take that vacation. So they're more concerned with the future. Neither one of those people, by the way, are wrong. They're just, they're focusing on different things. Interestingly enough, this is something that I found. Most open wallet people are not the ones who pay the bills. And by that, I don't mean that they don't contribute to paying the bills or that they're, you know, irresponsible in paying the bills, but they're not the one who sits down every month with a checkbook and writes out the actual check or makes the budget. It's usually the closed account person that will do that. And I, I just find that very fascinating because what happens is the open wallet gets very annoyed with the closed account person who's saying, hey, there's no money for those new shoes that you want. What do you mean there's no money? Well, the reason they don't know that is because they haven't looked at the budget. And in the meantime, the closed account person is really annoyed because they are looking at the budget and they say, hey, there's no money for shoes. And the open wallet person's going and spending money on shoes. So one simple little thing to eliminate that at least once a month, sit down together with your spouse. I know this is a little scary for the open wallet people, but sit down together and look at where your money is going together. You have to do that together. Five minutes, that's all it takes, just five minutes to get an understanding of, oh, that's why there's no money for shoes right now. I get it. Or is to say, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're spending all of this extra money on our future when there are some things that we need now. And so they need to look at those things together. The open wallet person feels secure in the having. So our, our wife that I was telling you about, she felt secure in making sure that they had all of their needs met in the now. You know, I feel secure in having a running car. I feel secure in having the right clothes for the children and food on the table. That makes me feel secure. The closed account person feels secure in the planning. They, they feel secure when they know what's going to happen in the future. Um, they like to sit down and cross their T's, dot their I's, move dollars over here and cents over here. That makes them feel a lot more secure, like they have a little bit more control. So, important. This is very important. Both the open wallet person and the closed account person need to be heard and respected. What do you think, Mark? You see people coming in to talk to you about marketing and financing all the time. You, this, this is a discussion you have with a lot of different people. Do you see these two different types of personalities? Oh, yes, daily. I mean, again, you're just nailing so many nails on the head. It's, it's incredible, Laura. I mean, obviously, it shows the, the depth of knowledge that you have and, uh, and the skill set uh, and the um, understanding and awareness that you've developed uh, over so many years uh, working in the trenches. So I'm, I'm glad you're able to distill uh, what many people may think is complex into very understandable bite-sized pieces of information. It's awesome. Um, thank you so much for doing this and I'm really enjoying it and looking forward to hearing uh, more of what's coming up. Oh, thank you, Mark, so much. So yes, the open wallet person and the closed account person both need to be heard and respected. Open wallet people understand that when you are so now focused and you're, you are so worried about spending things 
that will help you feel secure now, you are pushing your closed account spouse's fear buttons. You're causing them to be anxious and um, a little stressed out. And I see so many people, they're just bickering back and forth, back and forth, because they're not respecting the other person's you know, personality when it comes to money. And sometimes people don't even realize that they have these different personalities. They just assume they have this expectation, if you will, that the other person thinks like they do. And it's not true. Another thing, it's okay if one of you is an open wallet person and the other one's a closed account person. In fact, that is really good. Open wallet people, you need those closed account people so that you do have a good future, so that you are planning for a rainy day. Those are important things. Closed account people, you need those open wallet people to help you, you know, have a little bit more fun with your spending. And, and you know, somebody once said, if two people are exactly alike, one of you is unnecessary. <laughs> so it is important that, you know, they say opposites attract, and it's important to have both of these personalities in play here. It makes for a much happier home. Like I mentioned earlier, there is that complete budget form in the How to Have a God Solid Marriage Seminar course, and we'll give you some more information on that later. Again, I hate calling it a budget form, but it's a language we all understand, and that is available in the God Solid Seminar course. So here are some tips to help you better communicate money expectations. First off, be honest about which spending personality type you are. I don't know why this is. I have no idea. But a lot of times people will just deny that they are one personality type or the other. And I, I don't know if it's because they think there are negative connotations attached to that. For example, I see the the um, closed account person saying, oh, no, 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 I, I'm willing to spend money. I'm not a tightwad. Or I see the you know, the, the person that is more of a spender saying, oh, no, no, I, I'm responsible with the money. Well, just be honest. It's okay if you're an open wallet. It's okay if you're a closed account person. But you need to be honest with your spouse about that and be honest with yourself as well. Express your fears about the opposite spending personality type. Just say, you know, really, it scares me when you spend money on XYZ. It scares me when you save so much money because I'm worried about how my how are we going to you know get clothes for the kids or whatever. Compromise. Big fancy word that we hear all the time in regards to marriage. Compromise. The open wallet can save and the closed account person can spend. I know it's scary. I know it's uncomfortable, but it will not kill you. And most importantly, once again, respect each other's money anxieties. Understand that your spouse has some anxieties over how you handle money, and it's okay. And one more thing about money to keep in mind, very important. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. So open wallet people, if you are always focusing on the now, you are always going to have trouble when you're hit with a financial emergency. And closed account people, if you are always worried about your future and saving, you're going to miss out on some of the beautiful things that are happening right now. And this can be true about more than just money. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. Mark, we're going to move on and start talking about life stressors and how, how people in um, marriages can help each other through stress. You ready? I like it. Are we I'm stressing definitely. you out? <laughs> uh, no, it's, uh, it's creating a, a lot of peace, actually, because it's uh, creating um, clarity in some points that, uh, that have always been kind of uh, issues in my mind. So I, I'm, I'm really enjoying this, Laura. Thank you so much for sharing. Oh, good. I'm so glad you're getting something out of this, and I hope everybody is. So we know that there are life stressors. There are work demands, family demands, friends can cause stress, health, um, some type of crisis can cause stress, children can cause stress. I know I have three of them <laughs> that can cause stress. The media can cause stress, things that we take in, you know, when we watch the news or scroll through our Facebook feed. There are internal factors that can cause stress. So there are so many things that can cause stress in a person's life. Um, Mark, I want to back up for just a minute. On that note, in the How to Have a God Solid Marriage seminar course, there's actually a stress test 
that participants can take. Really? And that test will tell them where they are on the stress continuum. There are certain stressors that people collect throughout their lifetime. Um, you know, de death can cause stress. The death of a spouse can cause stress. There, uh, financial stresses. There are many things that can cause stress in a person's life. And the accumulation of that stress can cause physical problems, emotional problems, all sorts of problems for people. Finding out where you are on the stress continuum is unbelievably important. And here's why. Everybody has stress. And so what we find out once somebody takes that stress is, huh, they've scored in the normal range for stress. That's great. You know, they're going to, you were going to have stress. Everybody's going to score somewhere on this test. Then there are people who score so high on the stress continuum and may not even realize it because these are life stressors that have been accumulated over the course of years that they are at risk for homicide or suicide. And so what I see sometimes is that couples come into my office and what they're really dealing with is some severe stress and depression that needs to be addressed because if they don't address that, then they're at risk for abuse can happen in marriage. Um, some really serious stuff can happen all because they didn't even know that they were having stress issues. So just like men and women think and communicate differently, they also handle stress differently. Men need to escape to think. Women need to talk to process. So when a man is stressed out, when he's experiencing some type of stress, he wants to go into, remember we talked about those little boxes that men have? He wants to, or little rooms, he wants to go into his thinking room and just sort of escape and think about, you know, take his mind off of it. Women, however, want to talk about it. And that's how she gets, releases that from her body. I, I just want to talk about, can you believe this happened, that happened, da, 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 da. I think it is important to discuss what stress is and simply put, Stress happens when our demands outweigh our resources. So when we have all these demands coming at us in life and we don't have enough resources to meet those demands, stress can happen. For example, if your boss tells you you have 40 minutes to get to a meeting that's clear across the other end of town, but it's gonna take you an hour and a half to get across town because of traffic, might you experience some stress? What do you think? I would think so. <laughs> yes, a little bit of stress. So now you come home and you're, oh my goodness, you know, I'm so stressed out because I only had 40 minutes to get to a meeting that was an hour and a half away. And a man will probably want to come home and take a minute to do nothing, sit in front of the TV, just, he just wants to escape and decompress. When a woman, however, wants to tell you all about this lousy boss of hers that sent her clear across town to go to this meeting that she couldn't make in 40 minutes. So we, we process stress very differently. Men generally want to seek concrete answers to fix a problem. They, want to, they are problem solvers. They want to fix things and then everything will be all better and that, that will eliminate stress for them. A woman, however, needs to know what's going to happen. And, and here's something so, so easy to help a woman through that, is to simply say to her, it's going to be okay. If you try men to fix her problem, she's going to kill you. <laughs> she, doesn't, she doesn't need an, a concrete answer to fix something. She just wants to know, oh, it's all gonna be okay. And women, when you're, when you're trying to help your men through stress, what you need to do is help him find an answer if you can, a tangible answer. We know that stress can lead to anger and depression for both men and women. And this is some serious stuff that I see going on, very serious. People, when, when you're faced with so many demands that you can't meet them all, it is natural for you to become angry. And when that anger takes over your body, it then becomes natural it's, it's a chemical thing that goes on in the brain and people then become depressed. And a lot of times I see couples that are dealing with each other and they're really, they're angry and they're depressed because they're stressed, but they're taking it out on their spouses. A man will look for personal activities to relax generally. Um, you know, I want to go play a video game or 
go work on the car or go fishing, whatever personal activity he likes to do. Women, on the other hand, like to do activities that are more self-nurturing. They want to take care of themselves. I want to go, you know, hide and, and talk to my friends over a cup of coffee or because she likes to talk or, um, you know, I'm going to go get my hair done or get a pedicure. She likes to de-stress by doing some self-nurturing. So again, I want to stress that there's a stress test. You like what I did there, Mark? I love it. That was very <laughs> clever. I'm going to stress that back. There is a stress test unit in the How to Have a God Solid Marriage seminar course, and it's going to let you know where both you and your spouse fall on that stress chart, and that is such an important test for people to take. So here are ways you can help your spouse cope more effectively with their stress. First, let them cope with their stress their way. Women, I know that you want to talk about everything. And so when you see that your husband is stressed out, it's natural for you to want to offer your best advice to him and say, well, do you want to talk about it? Well, no, he does not want to talk about it. He wants to go think about it. <coughs> Excuse me. Men, I know that you love your wives. And you don't want them to be stressed out and you want to fix things for them. And you say crazy things to them like, well, just stop talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Not good. Let each other cope with stress however they need to cope with it. Find ways to lessen additional stress. In other words, if you see that, wow, my spouse is really stressed out because they have all this stuff going on. Let me see if I can take some of that off their plate. Find ways to lessen each other's stress. It's important. And don't let them use stress as an excuse for negative behavior. I see this all the time. Well, I, you know, I, was, I didn't mean to speak to her that way. I was just stressed out. People, that is not an excuse. We're all stressed out. We live in a very stressful world. Stressors come at us from all sorts of angles. And using that as an excuse is actually emotional and mental abuse. And I always tell my clients, you don't get to use stress as an excuse for negative behavior. Communicate kindly. It's just that simple. You know, you don't have to be rude to somebody. You can be polite, even in a marriage. And really important here, listen and don't compare. We have a tendency to want to compare our stress. Oh, my goodness, I had a really stressful day at work. Here's what happened. Oh, well, you think that was stressful. You should hear what happened to me. Folks, this is not a competition. You are not in competition with your spouse. This is a marriage. And so listen, listen respectfully. And it may be that both of you had a stressful day. That's okay. You both get to share your stories and you both get to listen respectfully. Just don't compare. Walk away from explosive behavior. When people are stressed out, sometimes they reach their breaking point and they can become verbally or physically explosive. If that's the case, walk away. We don't expect anybody to stay in a situation where that's continuously going on. Most importantly, be respectful. Mark, how do you handle stress? Do you, are you a thinker? Are you a talker? How do you handle stress? Uh, I go into my, my little empty box, uh, much to the uh, frustration of my wife. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is she a talker? Uh, being Hungarian, I would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> so when she's stressed, she's going to let you know about it. Oh, yeah, in spades. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. And that's, I mean, that's just so typical. It's just so normal. We're going to move on and start talking about having a shared foundation of existence. One of the problems that I see in couples is that they come into a marriage, but they don't have what I call it. It's like a common, a common theme, a common core, something, uh, some foundation that the two of them can begin to build a life together on. So discovering that one thing you have in common is a great start. Some people find that they have certain hobbies in common or they, have, they like the same music or, you know, just certain interests. But I'm going to tell you today that there is an even better foundation to build your marriage on. This foundation is going to be key if you're going to be able to apply the number one component of having a God solid marriage. Remember at the beginning of this webinar, I said, stay tuned because we were going to explain just that one thing, right? Well, if you get this down correctly, you'll be able to apply that number one component. Believe it or not, you ready for this, Mark? Studies show that the best foundation to build your relationship on is God. 
Now that may shock a lot of people, but let me explain to you why. This may be surprising to you, especially if you don't consider yourself to be a religious or spiritual person. But here is a statistical fact. Those who engage in spiritual and religious practices together, which teach in favor of respectful marriage, are 85% less likely to end a marriage with divorce than those who have no religious or spiritual engagement. So I don't know if that is surprising to you or not, Mark, but <laughs> here's, here's the thing. People who engage in a religious practice or some type of spiritual practice that teaches in favor of respectful marriage are 85% less likely to end a marriage with divorce. So here's why that is. When you are part of a community of people that are supporting you in a belief system that says, hey, marriage is good, marriage is positive, there, um, here's how you can respect your spouse, here's how you can love your spouse, when you're engaged with those people, it creates a little bit of accountability, it creates camaraderie, and you have that support system from those people around you because there are times when marriage does get tough. And you can go to those people and get answers that lead to respectful teachings about marriage. So, you know, people automatically go, oh, now you want me to go to church. Well, that is an ideal situation. Find a church that works for you. We're not going to promote any one brand of religion or anything like that in this webinar. But, find, you know, find what, what you're comfortable with. There are support groups out there for uh, all different types of support groups that have spiritual practices. There are all sorts of communities that you can belong to. As long as that community is teaching in favor of respectful marriage, you have a better chance of your marriage surviving if the two of you will participate in that together. So I think that's, sorry, Laura, for uh, jumping in here, but I think that's a very valuable point that I've really never considered for uh, about, but um, obviously um, a marriage is strengthened by, by having shared and common interests. Uh, and if you are with a, a group, a gathering of people that have like-minded beliefs, or if you can join in, uh, in into some type of a, a system where, um, you know, the, the great, uh, uh, you know, spiritual teachers uh, of, of the world in, in their writings and the, the, their followers um, all kind of teach and practice, um, you know, a, a very um, a, aware uh, to, to your fellow man, be kind, be good. Uh, you know, live a good life, you know, very, very good core principles. So I like what you said, you don't have to be involved and organized, but in something that allows us to, to see perhaps the greater good in all of us and, and the core values that you talk about and respect and such. Uh, I, I like that. That makes a lot of sense. You know, one thing that I encourage couples to do if they can, um, Make, make time, whether that's 60 seconds, I always have them start with just 60 seconds and maybe, maybe move on to four minutes a day, whatever they're comfortable with, but at least start with that initial 60 seconds of praying together. Hmm. Praying and meditating together is, you know, it binds people together in a way that it, it has to do with neural pathways in the brain and it creates this sense of, of accountability because now you are accountable, not just to each other, but to whatever, you know, th this power greater than yourself. Now you are accountable to God. And we're just going to use God in a generic sense here. Mm -hmm. So you are accountable to God. And that just creates a stronger bond between two people. So I tell them, pray 60 seconds a day. It doesn't matter what time of day, whatever works with your schedule, 60 seconds a day, and you will begin to see unbelievable changes. It opens up some new discussions between people. And now they have this new foundation. Mm -hmm. This is what we're going to start building, you know, our relationship on is this foundation here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. nice when married like people have a shared God foundation of existence, believe it or not, they have better sex. And that's going to be coming up later. They communicate better. They have less money problems. I bet that is shocking to you. They <laughs> cope with stress better. We know this, um, this is statistically proven that people who engage in regular religious or spiritual practices of some kind deal with stress better. We already talked about how damaging stress can be on a relationship. So being able to cope with that stress would be a great thing, wouldn't it? Definitely, Laura. They live longer, probably because they're not as stressed. 
and they have less difficulties raising their children. <coughs> Pardon me. There tends to be less abuse. They are physically healthier. They work towards common goals. They are less likely to have affairs or get divorced. So just having that shared God foundation of existence, find, you know, find a, a God that the two of you can come together on and start building from there. And oh my, I've seen just amazing things happen in people's relationships just because of that. They learn how to communicate better and that now they are building a foundation on God and that is just revolutionary. So there are, what I would suggest people do, there are specific God-centered principles that will lead to a solid shared foundation of existence, and you can go in search of that together. One of the neat things is when a couple takes that journey together, okay, maybe we don't know what we believe, or we don't, we've never really discussed our beliefs with each other. If they go in search of that together, it's sort of like a treasure hunt. And I've seen couples they, they come together on that and they'll come back into my office, you know, two or three weeks later, Hey, we were reading this together and this is what we think. And I think that's so wonderful because it's a, now it becomes a, we thing. God becomes a, we thing, not a, well, I believe this and you believe that it becomes a, we, and that's pretty neat. We're going to talk about that very uncomfortable subject. <laughs> we're going to talk about sex for just a moment. We're not going to get really in depth because it's such a, a personal subject and there's so much that we could cover on this subject mark there's a whole lot more on the subject in the how to have a God solid marriage seminar course which we'll offer to people at the end of of today's program but people have unrealistic expectations about sex they disregard what I'm telling people is to disregard the media and info on sex and sexuality do you really think that what is going on in the movies is real, Mark? Um, well, it's not happening in this house. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not happening in anybody's household, <laughs> I venture to say. There's so many unrealistic expectations about sex because people are watching these movies and maybe they're engaging in pornography or you know whatever it might be. And you need to just stop doing that because it's not, that's not real. Understanding your spouse's sexual appetite is extremely important. It's a great way to have a healthy sex life and marriage. So what do we know about men and women's sexual appetite? Well, what we do know is that from about the age 18 <coughs> on into their 30s somewhere, men's testosterone levels are through the roof, early 30s, and just through the roof. And boy, I'll tell you what, you know, there could be a a natural disaster happening right around them, but they're still willing to take time out to engage in sex because they're driven by those hormones that are running through their system. Mm -hmm. in the meantime, a wo woman's sexual appetite does not increase until she's well into her 30s. It's kind of a cruel trick of nature, don't you think? Yeah, it definitely is. So, you know, I, I see this. Men saying, well, you know, I, I would was kind of hoping we would engage in sexual activity four or five, six times a, a day, you know, a, a week, whatever it is. And a woman saying, my goodness, this is exhausting. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm busy with the children. I'm tired from work. And then she hits her late thirties and some of those early stressors begin to leave and her hormones begin to change and she is ready to have sex all the time. And now her husband is saying, Oh my goodness, again, <laughs> So you need to understand your, your spouse's appetite. Discover each other's love languages. There's a great book out there. I can't remember exactly what it's called. It's something about the, the five languages of love. And in the seminar course, we'll go through each one of those languages. So some people like to um, express love by giving gifts to somebody, and somebody else might express love by... Uh, spending time with them. Well, when you have two people who are speaking different languages, they can't hear each other or understand each other. And that carries over into the bedroom. So we teach people what, to discover what their own love language is and what their spouse's love language is so they can start speaking that to each other. And oh, it, it, it makes such a big difference once they end up in the bedroom. Oh, that's Personal that's well put, Laura. Yes. I just have to say that's well put the love language and and Two different languages and and yes you, of course you couldn't understand someone else if you don't know the language so uh, yeah wow that that's a real uh, aha moment for me thank you 
I think um, a personal acceptance and body image is so important. Throw away the images that you're seeing on television. Just get rid of them. Get rid of the images that you are seeing in pornography magazines or pornographic movies. Get rid of those. They are, they're not realistic and they're, they can be very damaging and have negative effects on people. We need to have some personal acceptance about how we look. You know, you're born in the, the body that you have. Obviously, your spouse was attracted to you enough to marry you. And I see too many people say, well, you know, I'm just not attractive anymore. Uh, you need to get rid of that. And we'll deal with that in this, the seminar course. Unraveling some bad habits. If you have, um, if you have addictions to alcohol, cigarettes, drugs, addictions to all sorts of things that could be exhausting your body, time to get rid of those because they will have negative effects on your sex life. Meet each other's sexual desires, not your own. Well, this may sound pretty um, uh, revolutionary. I guess the only word that comes to mind to some people, a lot of people are engaging in sexual activity for self-gratification. What am I going to get out of this experience? And then the, the sex act is over with and they leave less than satisfied. Well, it's been proven that when you spend time in the bedroom trying to meet your partner's sexual desires, not your own, you will actually end up feeling more satisfaction. You'll have better sex than you ever imagined if you spend time meeting your partner's desires, not your own. Not to say that you don't have your own desires that need to be met, but when two people are meeting each other's desires, it is a wow experience. Can I, I know just that say there something can be quickly? Yes, well, absolutely. It occurred to me, an aha moment for me. Basically, um, my thought is, is that pornography really is all about self-gratification. And, you know, what you just described as a, as a loving relationship where you're looking to please, you know, the partner, that is nowhere found in pornography. So I, I agree with you. Get rid of that and don't look at that stuff and look to see how you can um, give your partner pleasure. And the more you can please them, the more pleasure you get back. Absolutely. And I think that that is, was a wonderful statement that you just made, Mark. Very helpful. And we address in the seminar course a lot of what the negative effects of pornography are on the brain. Actually, it has some effects on the brain that you'd be surprised about. Mm. Not, and they're not positive effects. No, I'm sure. <laughs> so we know that there can be health issues for people. If you are experiencing some health issues, get to the doctor. Sometimes medication that people are on can cause them to have low sex drive or interfere with intimacy. So get that checked out. Or, you know, maybe you have a health issue going on that you need medication in order to be able to um, have a better sex life. No shame in that. It, we're fortunate to live in a world where medication is available. So get to the doctor if you can. And understand why sex is better in marriage. We don't hear that. What we hear is, oh... Boy, once you get married, your sex life, it's all downhill from there. And that is not true. There are so many reasons why sex is so much better in marriage. First off, you're not worried about transmitting diseases, hopefully. You know, that's a big stress relief right there. And once you've gotten to understand your partner, sex can be so much better. It's just, it is just a whole lot better in marriage. Okay, well, we are getting to the end here. But, and before we give you the number one way to have a God-solid marriage, we want to remind you of the opportunity to better your marriage with the How to Have a God-Solid Marriage Seminar course. So, Mark, this course includes five sections filled with downloadable workbooks and videos. Everything that we have talked about today is in that seminar course, and then some. And... The, the only difference between what's in that course and today is that you are going to get much more in-depth information. There's a, there are workbooks that go with that, so you'll have tangible and applicable things to do. I mean, you'll get some really solid tools in the, in the seminar course. Well, that sounds very exciting, and I, I've, I'm really very uh, pleased to uh, have had you invite me on the um, on the training today, Laura. And all I can say to to anyone else uh, as you're listening in, uh, I, and I know that you're all enjoying as much as I, uh, is uh, you know ch check this program out. It would certainly uh, seem to me that uh, with the information that you've provided thus far, 
uh, it can only get uh, deeper and better through the program. So uh, really thank you for putting the time and energy and, and passion uh, in, in uh, a program that uh, obviously designed to help people uh, get better at and uh, have, in fact, a, a God-solid marriage. So, uh, you know, I think everyone should... Uh, should run and not walk and, and just uh, just review uh, what you've put together and, and probably hop on board if they if they really are serious about uh, you know growing their marriage and, and uh, living a rich and, and meaningful life uh, uh, within their marriage with their partner. You know, Mark, by the time they're done taking that course, their marriage is going to be better than it has ever been because they're going to understand how to communicate better and reduce arguments. They're going to manage their finances better, reduce stress. They're going to laugh together. They'll have much better sex. They'll express their needs better and eliminate the guesswork out of marriage. How many times do we just sort of guess what our partner needs, you know? Yep. They're going to get rid of some baggage that's had damaging effects on their marriage, probably for since they walked down that aisle. And they're going to fall in love again. But finally, finally, they're going to have the marriage they want so I know that so far, everything that you've learned in this short webinar has been life-changing and helpful. In fact, if you were to just apply the techniques mentioned about how men and women think and communicate differently, you would already begin to see a positive change in your marriage. So if that's all that you take away from this webinar is, huh, men and women think and communicate differently. If that's all you take away, you're already going to start to see some changes in your marriage. And we've given you great information so far, and you're almost done. Just hang on for a little longer so you can discover the number one way to ensure your marriage is God solid. Are you ready for it, Mark? You've waited. I'm certainly time. ready. Yeah, I'm definitely here. Finally, the number one way to have a God solid marriage. This is it. This is, you can, I, the other stuff is really important, but this is it. This is the number one way. Forgive. It all boils down to a very simple word called forgive. I know that it can be difficult. I know that it sounds easier said than done, but trust me, you can forgive. I have seen so many couples who would there have been infidelity in the marriage. There's been abuse in the marriage. There have been all sorts of very negative things that have gone on, poor communication. And I know it can be difficult to forgive, but it can happen. And when you forgive, it's, it's like starting over. You get to restart your marriage all over. We have to understand what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. First, forgiveness is letting go of past hurts. It is not giving permission for someone to hurt you again. And I think too many times people think, gosh, if I forgive somebody, then they're just going to, that's like saying, oh, it's okay. You can hurt me all over again. And that's not what we're saying at all. Forgiveness is simply letting go of those past hurts and moving forward. It's being willing to start over and not using the past against your spouse. It is not a license to continue exhibiting bad behavior. You know, I call this grace abuse. If somebody forgives you, you don't go, oh, okay, well, I got forgiven, so let me go do it again. Forgiveness is not about getting to, uh, it's not, it's not a, it's kind of like a mulligan, <laughs> you know, in, in golf. It's a start over. It does, but when you start over, you start over with the new tools that you have. You start over doing things better. You don't start over with the same behavior. And it is not blaming. Forgiving isn't saying, well, I'll give you a second chance, but it's all your fault that we had these problems anyway. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is simply starting over. And two people can look at each other and say, you know what? On this day, there's a contract. There's an actual contract in the um, seminar course that people can go through and sign together that says we're going to start over. We're just going to start this marriage over, and now we have better tools. We, have, we know exactly what to do in order to have a happy marriage. So two people can forgive. But in order to forgive and start your marriage over, you need to stop. And what do we need to stop? We need to stop blaming, stop holding a grudge, stop nagging or shutting each other out, stop clinging to old behaviors. 
I'm not sure why you decided to come to this webinar today. Maybe it's because you wanted to make sure you were already handling your marriage the best possible way. And if that's the case, I am so happy. I am so glad that you joined us today. That means that you care about your marriage and you, you're just wanting to make sure that you've gotten some validation that, hey, that's great. We're on the right track. And I'm very, very excited for you. But and I fear that this is probably the case. It might be because you are having problems in your marriage and you want to discover the secret to having a God solid marriage, just like so many other people have. There are so many people who have figured out how to use the tools that we have presented to you today in this webinar and they've gone on to have happy marriages. So start forgiving, start communicating better, loving, laughing, enjoying, and just have a God solid marriage. Well, Mark, we learned a lot today, and um, because people were willing to spend so much time on this webinar with us today, I have some great news. The How to Have a God Solid Marriage uh, Seminar course, well, that can be theirs for only $297, which is $100 savings off of the regular price. Wow. And they can start having a God Solid Marriage today. So here's the deal. Here's what I know. By the time people get to this webinar, or they a lot of the couples that I see, by the time they get to my office, they are under so much stress. And a lot of that is financial stress, that there's no way that they are going to be able to go spend, we see this all the time advertised, take this marriage cruise. Well, that's $1,000 a person right there for the weekend, you know, take this weekend marriage cruise or go to our weekend getaway. And they're spending tens of thousands of dollars on this. And here's what I know. They come back from that. They had a great weekend, wonderful time. They come back, and by Wednesday, they're right back to square one <laughs> because they weren't given tangible, applicable tools to use that would be permanent and lifelong. It was just a feel good. And they're spending tens of thousands of dollars every year. Money is spent on these, like I said, these marriage cruises, these little marriage weekend getaways. And I'm not saying that those are not good things, they're, they're fine. But if you want something that's going to be permanent and lasting, you need to take the how to have a God solid marriage course. And remember, Mark, we are fighting against a billion dollar divorce industry. It's staggering how much money is lost and spent every year on divorce. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to create something that would be affordable for people. I don't want people to end up in divorce court and I want them to have this information. And so I, we needed to make it affordable for them. It's not a thousand dollar weekend. It is an affordable course with tangible, appliable information. Well, here's the thing, in order to make that <laughs> affordable for people, we put this course on, it, it, you can go to this link here. I'm gonna read this link to you because it's a long one. And the reason it's a long one is it, by having this longer link, we were able to keep the cost down for people. So if you'll go to lifesolidcourses.thinkific.com forward slash courses forward slash how dash to dash have dash a dash god dash solid dash marriage if you go to that link right there then you're going to be able to take this course and get your marriage on track for life what do you think mark i think that's that's amazing laura um and uh i know the link is long but uh the uh, the time uh just entering that into a person's uh, search bar uh, taking them to this uh, to this program uh, and getting involved um, will will be magical. That that's all I can say. I mean, you have given me so much uh, to to consider and reflect on, and uh, it just shows me the uh, the the knowledge, the depth, and understanding you have, um, and the insights that you can share, and how to bring it down to practical terms that uh, that a lay person like I uh, can understand. And if I can understand it, then it means I can take action on it. And I know all the information on the world is, is not going to do anyone any good unless they take action. But I know that through your program, uh, as you've mentioned, uh, there are actionable you know, exercises. So it, uh, it will mean that people will have a transformation and they will get um, you know, fantastic results 
uh, by going through your program. So uh, again, kudos to you for for putting this out there. And uh, again, I encourage everyone to to check it out for them for themselves to see if it's right for them. But uh, I'd be very surprised if uh, if they didn't agree and and jump on board. So thanks for making it um, affordable as well, Laura. And uh, let's all put the uh, divorce lawyers out of business. Absolutely. We're, we're fighting that industry. One more thing I wanted to mention, Mark, I recognize that sometimes it's very difficult to get your spouse to, hey, I want to take this course. Will you take it with me? And a lot of times you feel, I don't want to take that course. You know, how many couples have had to drag one spouse or the other to marriage coaching? So I recognize that. And here's what I want to tell you. Even if you have to take this course without your spouse, that's fine. The course is set up in such a way that you can take it by yourself, no problem. Obviously, you would want to take it with your spouse, but here's what I know for a fact, because I've seen it happen so many times when one person will come to me for coaching without their spouse. They start applying just some of the communication techniques at home, and their spouse is like, hey, why are things getting better? What, what's going on here? You know, <laughs> And um, it opens up a dialogue where all of a sudden they're very interested in what's in that course. Mm-hmm. I want to know what's in that course. And so you may have to start out taking it by yourself and, you know, maybe you want to take it and your wife is not yet interested, but I promise you when she starts to see some of this stuff in the workings, she'll be interested mm-hmm. and take it right along with you mm-hmm. or the other well, way around. That was very helpful to know. And it, it makes so much sense because, uh, uh, it usually is one spouse or the other that will initiate something in the marriage and uh, then right. bring the other one along. So thanks for, for uh, just putting that out there. Yeah. The other thing that I did want to point out about the course too, that we didn't touch on, this is for the entire course. I know there are some courses out there where you pay this amount and then you get part of the course and then they'll ask you to pay more and you get the the extra secrets. Well, we didn't do that. Instead, we put it all in one course, all of it. I just, I didn't think that it was fair to get people into the course and then only give them part of the information. So they'll get the entire course. Fantastic. Well, this discount offer is only exclusive to those who've watched the entire webinar. And so, you know, I would hurry on this (laughs) because at some point that that rate's going to go back up to the normal cost. And I'd hate for anybody to have to pay full cost if you know, they don't want to. So that's for the entire How to Have a God Solid Mar- Marriage Seminar course. And just simply head over to the link that we showed you earlier. You'll get the workbooks. Um, they're, they're more like worksheets, I would say, but the, you can download those or not. Just watch it on the commuter, c- computer if you want. There's the communication workbook, baggage and expectations, sex and money, stress and marriage, creating a shared foundation. And then there are videos that go along with every chapter as well. I know that happy couples have already benefited from applying the teachings that are in that course to their marriage. So many people have discovered the secret to having a happy marriage, and I know that you can have a happy marriage as well. So people who apply these techniques are less likely to get divorced have an affair, feel depressed, worry, get angry, or feel trapped. They're more likely to be healthier, happier, wealthier, and full of energy. Mark, that's all we have for everybody today. I want to thank everyone for watching the How to Have a God Solid Marriage webinar. If you have any questions about marriage, I would invite you to send me an email. The email is laura at followlaura.com and just you know drop me an email if you have questions about the course if you have questions about the information in today's webinar just get a hold of me again that's laura at followlaura.com any final words of wisdom before we go mark uh i have no words of wisdom i just have uh, words of thanks for um, inviting me uh, and inviting others who in turn will listen and learn through the uh, the training that you've provided here and uh, who will no doubt and should take the next step and uh, go through your uh, your very in-depth um, training program um, to achieve the uh, the transformation that they they want in their marriage and uh, through your guidance and expertise uh, come out the uh, the other side um, stronger and, um, you know, embracing the institution 
uh, for all it is and um, for having uh, utilized your uh, your knowledge and program to uh, have made their marriage everything it could be and uh, hopefully everything more than uh, even in their wildest dreams they thought it would be. So thank you, Laura. Oh, well, thank you for joining the call today, Mark. And again, to everybody who's been watching, you've been watching the How to Have a God-Solid Marriage webinar, and we thank you for joining us. We hope you all have a wonderful day.